Okay, thanks. Welcome to um, the Ortho Sports Super Spreader event of the year. Um, <laughs> if, you've already had, if you've already had COVID, don't worry, there are plenty of new variants. And there's an ocean liner docking in Sydney today with 800 positive cases. So, um, all right. So first question is, uh, we're going to talk about sesamoids. Um, why do we have sesamoids? I don't know. But if I ever meet the maker, it's the first thing I'll ask him, or her, or she, or they. Um, so sesamoids, you, you've seen them. They're very, very, uh, everybody's got them. And, but they're often variants. So when you see sesamoids, about 70% of people have the ones you can see at the top there, which are in one piece but about 30% have bipartite or tripartite or quadripartite sesamoids. Uh, I put an x-ray there of me, that's me, Jay, and I've got bipartite sesamoid and a fracture on the other side. Uh, I used to run a lot, and, and I can assure you there's nothing nicer than running around the edge of Sydney Harbour on a moonlit night with Pink Floyd playing. There is, uh, no, it's the most fun you can have with your trousers on. Um, so uh, I used to run and I trashed my sesamoids. So the sesamoid, the best way to think about it is it's a uh, it's a bone in the tendon of the flexor hallucis brevis, and it has attachments medially, laterally, and distally. The tibial sesamoid is bigger, and they're bipartite in approximately 30% of patients. So if you have a look at this schema here, you can see what they look like. Uh, it's a bit analogous to the kneecap, only you have two of them, so it's more interesting. And they've got attachments, and the flexor hallucis longus tendon runs between the two, and there's a synovial joint between the sesamoid and the metatarsal head. And you can see those two muscles there are the, the heads of the flexor hallucis brevis. Um, remember when they used to teach anatomy to medical students? It's now all about gender studies. So um, they've got um, flexor hallucis brevis, and then you've got the adductor hallucis medially, the uh, adductor laterally, and you've got the insertion into the base of the proximal phalanx. And so what happens to pathology? What's the pathology that can happen? Any sort of synovial joint, they can get bigger, they can break, you can get a keratosis between them, you can get nerve compression, you can get arthritic change, they can sublux. Um, you'll often see an x-ray or radiology report saying the patient has sesamoiditis. Um, it's a term that you probably shouldn't use because nobody really knows what it means. It means sort of inflammation of the sesamoids. Um, it used to be termed as a, a, a sign seen on a bone scan where the sesamoid lit up on bone scan. Now you see bone marrow edema on, a, on an MRI. But I think, uh, you know, I use it as a diagnosis of exclusion. I don't usually use the term. Uh, what's the best way to image a sesamoid? It's plain x-rays. So initially we take, you know, an AP lateral. That's a sesamoid axial view, and you can see quite clearly there's a fracture through this sesamoid. Right, that costs the community 50 bucks. Right, everybody wants an MRI scan because their beautician said MRIs are really good, you should get an MRI scan. Um, don't worry, we get it too. Um, that's a sesamoid oblique view, and you can see there the, the fracture through the sesamoid. I mean, this is not rocket science. Um, and there you can see on the standing AP view, you can see the, the sesamoid fracture through there. Um, now, this is a case which I'll show you very quickly. Um, this is a young rugby forward who had pain in his first MTP joint. Um, and if you have a look there, he's got a little cleft in the, uh, the ligament between sesamoid and base proximal phalanx. And you can see on this other view here the beautiful cleft shown. This young chap had three MRI scans before a plain x-ray. And if you look at his plain x-ray here, you can see that on the left side is normal. The sesamoids are quite close to the base of the proximal phalanx. On the right side, there's daylight between the sesamoid. And so this is a very significant turf toe injury. Uh, and in a rugby forward, in a scrum with you know, 800, p 800 kilograms of pressure behind it, this is a very significant and potentially career-ending injury. Uh, additional imaging, we don't use, tend, to, tend to use bone scan much these days. Uh, a good CT scan is still a great test. That's a CT scan there, and you can see how beautifully you see the bone. Always remember CT scan is better for bone, despite the fact the patient wants an MIR. MIR. Um, get a CT scan if you're worried about bone. Uh, sesamoid blood supply is fascinating. You're all interested in that. Um, so non-operative care of the sesamoid. Um, if they're running and jumping on their sesamoid, stop running and jumping on their sesamoid. So put them in a boot. Um, if they're cyclists, you can move the cleat of the bike back a little bit so there's no pressure under the area. Uh, walking cast for fractures. Um, if you're going to get them to have an insole, don't just say to the podiatrist, you know, insole, because then they get an arch support and everyone gets an arch support. Um, tell them specifically that you want to cushion the sesamoid. And there's a very nice material called silipose, which is anti-shear, uh, and they can cut out under the sesamoid, put some silipose in it, cushions it very nicely. Um, sometimes as well you guys will find taping useful, because you bring the sesamoid back, uh, uh, you know, you approximate the edges. Um, surgically, if they've got a keratosis, uh, so in other words, hyperkeratotic area beneath a sesamoid, you can shave a sesamoid, five-minute operation. Sometimes add a dorsiflexion osteotomy if they've got a cavus foot. 
Um, grafting non-unions is talked about a lot, but you really need a fracture that is really undisplaced and you can take some bone from the metatarsal head. Um, well described, but we don't do it very often. Uh, I've sort of done it once or twice in 20 years. And um, so you take a bit of bone from the metatarsal head, as you can imagine, or, or the calcaneus, you know, there's not a lot of bone in the sesamoids. Uh, you put it in there and mostly it works if you pick the right patient, like everything in surgery. Now, the interesting talk. Okay, now accessory bones are very interesting because a lot of the work on this was described in the German literature in the 1850s. Now, why is that interesting? Because x-ray wasn't invented until 1895. So the Germans knew about all these bones, and I can assure you everyone in this room has seen these bones. So the common ones are os peroneum, os trigonum, you all know about. My favorite one is os vesulanum, um, then os calcaneus secundarius, os, and you'll see these bones, and I'll go through some examples for you. So the os peroneum is a sesamoid in the tendon of peroneus longus as it courses the cuboid. So you can see there what it looks like. It normally sits under the cuboid on the outside. You've all seen this on the oblique view. Uh, what happens then is that the patient's a tennis player often and they run up for a big smash and they feel this almighty crack in their foot. And what happens is that the peroneus longus tendon ruptures distal to the sesamoid and the, the os peroneum and it retracts proximally. So you see that on the plain films. My face falls like, like that? No. All right. So, so what happens is the, uh, is it because I'm too tall? Oh, I'm turning around, right? sorry about that. Uh, okay, so, so you see the os peroneum retracted and you, know, you can see it on the plain films and, and, you know, and the patient thinks you're rather clever. Um, os trigonum you all know about, it's the cause of posterior pain described in ballet dancers, fast bowlers. Um, the positive apprehension test, so you squeeze the foot down into full plant deflection uh, to reproduce their pain. Um, that's a nice example of an os trigonum, you're not gonna miss that one. Um, and surgery on them actually works rather well as long as the os trigonum is the only problem. Um, occasionally you'll take out an os trigonum and the patient says it still bloody hurts. And what happens was because they had some underlying arthritis uh, or something else going on in the back of the subtalar joint. Uh, os vesulanum. Now this is a case that I saw recently and it's the base of the fifth metatarsal and it's often confused with a fracture. And it's named after Andreas Vesalius uh, and it's an ununited ossification center. And if you look at it, that's what it looks like there. And it's nice and smooth. And, hang on, go back one. So it's nice and smooth, and you can see that, you know, the, the, the way to differentiate a fracture from an accessory ossicle is fractures have sharp edges. Right? So this is smooth, but it was reported by a fracture by a radiologist, of course. And so let me tell you about Vasily, this interesting chap. For about 1,300 years, anatomy was dominated by Galen, and Galen used to pull apart animals and then decided that the anatomy of animals translated directly to humans. Uh, and then Vesalius said, no, I don't think this is true. And he befriended a judge who, after they hung and executed criminals, gave him the bodies to dissect. Um, very, uh, these were politically incorrect times. So, um, so he started dissecting these bodies, and he basically rewrote anatomy. And he was a visiting professor in, uh, in Padua. And if you have a look at that, that's, uh, that's a picture you might have all seen, because you, you guys probably do far more anatomy now than medical students. So that's the picture of Vesalius. Um, now, that's a Pergamon, which, where Galen was born, which is in sort of modern-day Turkey. And this is what their anatomy museums used to look like. So they'd have the, you know, the criminal on the slab, all the medical students around, and, uh, and they'd be dissecting it. So, you know, this is long gone now. We're all learning about gender studies. Uh, okay. Um, so this next one is the os calcaneus secundarius. This is a nice one. The Latin names just, just sort of turn me on. They really do. So this is an accessory bone here between the calcaneus and the navicular. And you can see this big thing here seen on MR. Again, initially treated as a fracture. Um, Os intermeditarsium, you'll see this every now and then. This is a bone on the top of the foot. It often presses on the deep branch of the perineal nerve and gives patients the pips when they're in shoes or any sort of shoe that rubs on the top. Uh, accessory navicular, everyone's favorite. Um, think of it as a sesamoid in the, in the bone of the posterior tibial tendon as it inserts into the navicular. And you'll, come and see, you'll commonly see this in someone who sprains their ankle and they come back and say, look, my ankle doesn't hurt, but I've got a second ankle bone. Right? And they point to the medial border of their navicular and you see this accessory ossicle. Uh, often they rest, uh, in a rest in a bootle settle it, sometimes you've got to fix them. Um, that's what it looks like there, you can see the accessory bone there. And if you do fix it, sometimes the patient's got a flat foot and you've got to shift their heel at the same time. Uh, os subfibulare, you'll see this all the time in patients with sprained ankles. When you take an x-ray and you've got this corticated round ossicle beneath the tip of the fibula. All right, very, very common. And again, you manage this as an ankle sprain. You don't, you know, you don't sort of worry about the bone despite the fact the patient fixates on the bone. Uh, okay, now Achilles tendon rehabilitation. This is very quick and this is very topical. Um, 
there was a paper that was, you know how every now and again you read a paper and you think, God, that is so smart, I wished I'd thought of that, but I never did. Uh, and what happens is they got a bunch of people and they randomised them to two different kinds of re rehabilitation after an Achilles rupture to determine whether or not the rehabilitation mattered with stretching the Achilles, which made the patient less able to push off. So what they did is they got 18 patients at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit. Do you all know about Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit? It's one of the roughest places in the world. They have a police station in the casualty of Henry Ford Hospital because the gang members that are partially injured often have someone come in with a machine gun to finish them off in the casualty. I'm not kidding, it's true. So that's Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit. God bless America. Um, so, uh, so anyhow, so they've got a bunch of patients, level one, and they put metal markers in the Achilles tendon at the time of surgery. So if you have a look here, you can see they put a metal marker in above and below the rupture. And what they did was that they then put the first group in plaster for six weeks, right, no stretching, and the second group they did early mobilisation to see whether or not the distance between the two markers, and it's very clever, isn't it? It's also very good to get ethics approval to do it. Um, so six weeks non-weight bearing versus two weeks in a non-weight bearing boot and four weeks. And what did they find? Both groups stretched, interestingly. And both groups stretched. And what they found is that most of the stretching occurred at between two and six weeks, but also lengthening occurred between six and 12 weeks. Um, now, why is this important? Uh, was there issues with the study? It was three different surgeons, different repair techniques, but either way, it's still clever. Um, so if we're concerned about tendon lengthening as a cause of, you know, you know when you repair Achilles, most of them get back to sport, but they don't all get back to sport. And we think that they're losing push-off strength because the tendon is lengthening. All right, so the message to you guys is don't stretch the hell out of them in the first three months. Because often they go to physio and go, oh, 38 millimetres knee to wall, or, or, or 32, or well, stretch it, don't do it, okay, just don't do it. And I often write to you guys, don't stretch the Achilles in the first three months, no eccentric work. You guys are scientists, you love to measure things, right? Stop measuring it and don't stretch them. Um, so that's the take home message. Uh, if any of you ever go to Rome, go and have a look at this. I think that's all I've got to say, Doron. <laughs>